All right, I apologize for the delay. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Our moderator got stuck at the airport, so I'll be doing the intro. Um, welcome to the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition cost. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event. Dr. Christopher Moran is a reader in U.S. National Security in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Warwick in the UK. He is the author of several books, including Classified, Secrecy in the State in Modern Britain, and Company Confessions, Secrets, Memoirs, and the CIA. Funded by the British Academy, he is currently writing a history of the turbulent relationship between President Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, and the CIA, featuring new revelations about White House dirty tricks, as well as critical reflections on the role played by the agency in facilitating SALT, S-A-L-T, American withdrawal from Vietnam, and triangular politics between the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. Together with colleagues from John Hopkins and Leicester University, he is the co-editor of the new Georgetown Studies in the History of Intelligence book series. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much for the extremely kind words of, 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 of um, invitation there. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful to be here. Thank you. It's, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, um, it's a very prestigious place to be, and um, I'm very honoured to be sharing my, my thoughts on, on the subject of government secrecy um, with you. So, what, what's kind of the context for today's talk? Well, really, the context is today, um, just like in the past, I, governments are committed to keeping secrets. Um, in the United States, some um, 11 billion dollars, a quite staggering amount, is spent annually on security classification. Um, also in the United States, some 5 million people have security clearances. That's roughly equivalent um, to either the population of Norway or the greater metropolitan DC area. Um, it's been estimated that some 10 billion secret documents are actually generated uh, every year in the United States. And if we need just more evidence that, um, that governments are committed to, to keeping secrets, we only have to look back to the presidency of, of Barack Obama. Barack Obama, despite obviously being on the electoral hustings in 2008 and 2012, promising to bring the most transparent or the most open administration in US presidential history, he actually prosecuted more whistleblowers or more leakers than all previous presidents combined. But the point I want to try and, and get across today is that while the, the appetite for secrecy among governments in the West remains strong, remains as strong as it ever has been, actually the ability to achieve secrecy has arguably never looked weaker. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen a whole host of major revelations. Um, characters like uh, Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, um, Chelsea Manning, they, they, they roll off the tongue now. They've almost become legends in, in their own right. We've seen things like the Panama Papers. We've seen WikiLeaks. Um, obviously, right now, we've got impeachment hearings against President Trump stemming to a large extent from a leak. From, um, from, from, from a CIA whistleblower. So governments want to keep secrets, but their ability to keep them prima facie seems to be getting harder and harder. And what I want to, to, to put to you is this. If we take Edward Snowden, when these revelations first came out, everyone has, in, in the media and commentators, they tend to be, um, they've tended to frame the Snowden leaks as being a crisis of privacy. Um, the Snowden leaks tell us, according to Edward Snowden, that U.S. intelligence authorities, U.S. government, is trying to monitor our, our, our Facebook updates, our social media activity, our telephone conversations, crisis of privacy. But I think the point that I want to, to, to get across to you today, actually, is that there's also a crisis of secrecy going on. And actually, in the Pentagon, at Langley, 
at the FBI, it's that crisis of secrecy that is causing more sleepless nights for officials than any purported crisis of privacy. So from the, pers from the perspective of officials, I would, I would put to you that the most worrying development is not government looking at us, i.e. revelations about privacy, but us looking at government. And this is a big issue for uh, in, in officials to, to, to justifiably worry about. Um, positively, secrecy, I mean, it has its advantages for policymakers and national security practitioners. It allows policy options, um, potential intelligence operations to be thought about, planned, and executed, free from the hubbub of the political marketplace, free from the glare of public scrutiny. More negatively, of course, secrecy can be used to hide um, instances of illegality, wrongdoing. But whatever the motivation, um, clearly the, 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 the fact that secrecy is something of a diminishing asset is, is a major concern for officials right now. So this is just a little roadmap of, of where I'd like to take the conversation today. First and foremost, what I'd like to do is try to understand and explore the drivers behind this present crisis of secrecy. What is causing this present crisis of secrecy? And then at the very end, I'd like to just unpack um, a few thoughts on how government might actually respond to this predicament that they find themselves in presently. The argument that I'll be putting forward really is, is threefold. Um, first and foremost, I think I would say that whistleblowers, and there's been a lot of them in, in recent years, um, they're actually not the cause of the current crisis of secrecy. They are symptomatic of it. They're symptomatic of other changes that are taking place um, within intelligence and within society at large in, in, in the 21st century. So where, therefore, does the crisis stem from? Well, I, I think it stems from three elements. First of all, I'll argue that the, 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 the crisis of secrecy stems from changes in the nature of the intelligence business in the 21st century. Intelligence is starting to look a little bit different today to how it was looking 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Secondly, I want to argue that the, 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 the crisis of secrecy is being brought about by cultural changes within government, including the attitude of private contractors and IT community collaborators. One of the main points I want to get across to you today is that since 9-11, the US intelligence community has seen an influx not only of private contractors, but an influx of talent from Silicon Valley from the Pacific Northwest, uh, and actually people that have grown up on the campuses of Berkeley and Stanford and UC San Francisco and UC Santa Barbara, they're just wired a little bit differently. They're wired a little bit differently. They have different views of the national security state. They have different assessments of what the internet should mean. And then finally, I'd like to point out that technology, techn technological advances, are actually doing a lot to bring about this crisis of secrecy as well. And I think, bearing all that in mind, I guess my main takeaway is that, look, I, I think we're moving from an age of, of secrecy to an age of um, what one national security practitioner um, quite aptly defined as an age of delayed disclosure. In other words, things will come out. Things will inevitably come out. And this is a big sea change for national security practitioners and policy makers because this is a brave new world where they always need to ask themselves, how will this look when, not if, how will this look when this comes out? It's that shift from if to when that I think we're seeing at the moment. So first of all, just some theoretical framework, some theoretical framework, a few conceptual orientations. Um, what is secrecy? How do we define secrecy? Um, I think Stephen Aftergood, who's, uh, who works for the Federation of American Political Scientists, offers quite a useful typology um, of, of, of secrecy that I'd just like to, to, to unpack for you now. Aftergood says, first of all, there are genuine national security secrets. There, are, there is sensitive, sensitive information that has to be kept secret. Um, 
because alas, if that information is put out into the, into the public domain, it will damage US national security, it will damage uh, US equities overseas, it will put lives at risk, etc., etc. It will undermine sources and methods. These type of secrets, um, former director, director of Central Intelligence, William Colby, um, famously described in the 1970s as being good secrets. He called these good secrets. Secondly, there are what Aftergood describes as political secrets. Um, he, what he's not saying here is you know, secrets kept by politicians. It's, it's a much more nefarious expression than this, than, than this. It's describing the type of secrets that are kept in order to hide evidence of, of illegality or wrongdoing or abuse, etc. And William Colby, again, back in the 1970s, he described these as bad secrets. Thirdly, there's also what has been described a culture of secrecy, even allowing for the fact that culture as a term is very fluid and nebulous and almost as hard to kind of capture in your hand as, as, as air. Nonetheless, there's been what's been described as a culture of secrecy within intelligence organizations where the kind of the, 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 the prevailing motto is, well, if in doubt, classify. Um, let's have secrecy even if there's not a legitimate national security reason for having it. Um, so in other words, secrecy is kind of an end in itself, irrespective of whether there's a genuine need to, 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 to keep it. It's quite an interesting one. Um, symbolic secrecy. Um, the idea here is that, that, that there's a certain ritualistic or symbolic value to secrecy. It's a way to distinguish insiders from outsiders. It's a way to distinguish the inner sanctum, if you like, from the periphery. And finally, quite a useful um, expression, there's also what, what can be called deep secrets or double secrecy. These, th th this is an expression used to describe secrets that actually even very senior individuals don't even know exist. So a couple of examples of that could be something like the, the ultra secret. Uh, and the breaking of German Enigma um, codes during the Second World War. Remarkably, even half of Prime Minister Winston Churchill's war cabinet was completely oblivious to what was going on at Bletchley Park. They hadn't even heard of Bletchley Park. For them, it was just a, a remote village, a remote town somewhere north of London. They had no idea because deep secrecy was in effect. Another example could be um, the CIA's memorial war. Uh, I think at a last count, there's something like 130, there may be some, some more now, but let's say for argument's sake, 130 stars chiseled on the memorial wall, each signifying um, an officer who's fallen heroically in, in the line of duty. I was astonished when I was reading the memoirs of CIA director Richard Helms, who was CIA director for the best part of a decade, but also being a kind of a high wattage luminary in intelligence, in the US intelligence community for the best part of three decades. He wrote in his memoir that even he, of all people, even he didn't know um, all the names of the individuals who are um, symbolized on, on this kind of solemn constellation of stars on, on the CIA memorial wall. So even Helms, if you like, was a kind of a, of a victim of, of, of double secrecy. In recent years, we've also seen some new ideas around secrecy. Um, brilliant book by um, Timothy Melly um, on, on, on cultures of secrecy, and particular, particularly looking at the popular culture of the Central Intelligence Agency. He says that we're starting to live in an age where secrecy sells. We live in an age where, as he coins it, um, there are spectacles of secrecy. Spectacles of secrecy. What, what he's getting at here, he's looking at films like Zero Dark Thirty, Films like Argo, so these are films where the CIA's entertainment liaison office have worked with filmmakers, have worked with scriptwriters, and they've actually voluntarily, they've willingly put hitherto classified information, they've declassified it, they've put it into the public domain, and as a result, argues Timothy Valley, it's led to these spectacles of secrecy, where we can go to the multiplex, the cinema screen, and actually see secrets up on the silver screen. The political scientist Siegmund, Pau Siegmund Bauman, I think, off offers some, some useful interventions in this area. He, he's written, he, he coined this idea of the Mobius strip. I 
I include a little image there on the right. Um, Bauman argues in the 21st century, um, we have started to see a blurring between public and private. We've started to see a blurring between friend and enemy. We've started to see a blurring between intelligence and information, state and society. In other words, these binaries are starting to break down. I think we can apply that to some extent to the world of secrecy. Um, I think we're living in a world where secrecy and openness are, is, is a much more blended phenomenon. Um, we're, we're seeing a Mobius strip, a mishmash of transparency and secrecy at, at the same time. So turning then to the, 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 the drivers of, of the current crisis of secrecy. First of all, I would say to you, big data. In order to understand the crisis of secrecy, we have to think about how the business of intelligence is changing in the 21st century. Um, you're probably all sat around the table right now with phones in your pocket. Uh, those phones are collecting information about you. Uh, we live in a world of big data. Um, actually, when I put this slide together, it was a couple of years ago now, it's probably, this figure here is probably double, but um, human beings generate a staggering 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. In 2012, I'd love to see what the latest figure is, in 2012, the world sent over 8 trillion text messages. Uh, in the future, we will probably blink and send an email, but it won't be called an email, it'll be called something else. Um, our homes, our Amazon Alexas, our televisions, they're all smart enabled. They're all generating data 24-7. And intelligence agencies, they are, um, they are gathering this data. Um, they are storing this data. They like this data. They like this data, why? Because, as it has always been the case, increased knowledge about the world is seen as a security solution. Um, increased knowledge is a way to mitigate risk in an uncertain world. Um, interestingly, this was about two or three years ago, scientists from MIT actually did research that suggested that had intelligence agencies had mined and harvest, harvested social media prior to the Arab Spring in 2013, they actually could have seen this coming. They would have seen, through social media intelligence, they would have seen the Arab Spring coming six months before the Arab Spring took place. That's the type of data, the world of knowledge intensive security the world of knowledge intensive security that, 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 that we are now witnessing. And it is changing the intelligence business. The point that I want to get across to you here is that this new landscape, this new landscape of big data, it has ramifications for secrecy. And it has ramifications for secrecy because the ownership of secrets is changing. In this new world of knowledge intensive security, <coughs> Secrets, national security secrets, no longer belong to just specialised government departments. Actually, national security secrets are spread much more diffusely across government, local government and business subcontractors. And then you've actually got private organisations that have no links to the national security state that themselves collect and analyse sensitive information pertaining to national security. So you think of things like airlines, banks, internet service providers. These are all bodies that are collecting and analysing very sensitive, potentially very sensitive national security information on a daily basis. So the point here is that national security secrets, which so long were an expression of national sovereignty, have become globalised and they've become privatised. And a key takeaway here is that whistleblowers, I would argue, absolutely thrive within this, this new connected security realm. And I think Snowden is, is a particularly good example of this. This is someone who sits right at the middle of that Mobius strip that Bauman was talking about between state and society, between public and private. This is someone who didn't work for the state so much. He worked for a private contractor, Booz Hamilton, but nevertheless had unbelievably remarkable access to privileged information. This is someone who knew that he couldn't extract the most sensitive information out of NSA headquarters at Fort Meade, but he could extract it 
in a facility on the other side of the Pacific in Hawaii, in Hawaii where he knew that the very latest security software had, had not been installed. Second driver of, the, of this crisis of secrecy. I, I think I would put to you that government itself is to some extent responsible for, for this current crisis of secrecy. So a little bit of context here. After 9-11, all the various inquiries that took place concluded, a lot of the inquiries concluded, that it was absolutely imperative that national security agencies move from a culture of need to know to need to share. Uh, one of the big lessons learned from these various inquiries was um, had these agencies prior to 9-11 played a little, a little better with others, um, if the information had gone in the right hands at the right time, at the right place, this thing might have been avoided. So what you see post 9-11 um, is kind of an orgy of sharing. And, and, and I, I think I would put to you really that the shift from the need to know principle to the need to share principle, it went a little bit too far. I think, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm sort of you know, saying anything particularly outrageous here. I just think right now there are far, far, far too many people in the United States and in the United Kingdom, uh, my, my, my home country, far too many people with access to sensitive security information as I said earlier, some five million people in the United States um, currently have uh, classified um, access. S staggering statistic, some 600,000 people had access to the Pentagon system that Chelsea Manning had access to, uh, the system that allowed him to, to pass this information along to, to Julian Assange. We now know that um, post 9-11, under unrelenting 24-7 pressure from the Bush White House to do something about intelligence. A lot of, a lot of security contractors, a lot of, a lot of people were actually just given interim clearances, uh, interim security clearances that were just kept on ad infinitum without a proper review. So far too many people being given um, access to sensitive information. And just through sheer dint of numbers, that, that is problematic. It's, it's a recipe for, for disaster. But I think this, there's actually a twofold problem here. One, as I say, um, lots of people, more people have access to secrets. That in itself is problematic. But what's, what's also problematic is actually who these people are. Culturally, philosophically, a lot of the people that now have access to secrets, they just look very different to the holders of secrets from the height of the Cold War. So I would put to you really that the slightly um, controversial position that for many people who work in the national security space today, intelligence it's not a privilege, uh, it's not even a career, and it's certainly not a calling. So CIA Director Richard Helms in his memoirs, he describes working for the CIA as a calling, almost sort of describes it in sort of quasi-religious terms as, as, as a calling. I think for a large chunk of people working in the national security space today, that's just simply not the case. Working in intelligence, it's a job. It's, it's a job just like any other. It's a job that you might do for a few months or a few years, and then you go on to do another job. And in this space, I think, um, there is simply just not the same levels of respect. There's not the same levels of deference towards the sort of traditional gentlemanly honourable codes of secrecy that existed during the, um, the, the, the height of, of, of the Cold War. I think related to this, the, the nature of intelligence work in the 21st century, um, being, being you know, a world of desk jockeys sitting behind a computer terminal, studying, um, harvesting massive amounts of data, um, it doesn't really build up a, an esprit de corps a belief in the mission in the way that, that I think existed at, at the height of, 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 of the Cold War. Really important point now. I will put to you that secrecy is also being undermined by the alliances that government built with the information and communi commun communication industry after the Cold War. So what happens after the end of the Cold War, the, 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 the intelligence community is faced with two horrible realities. One it sees its funding cut, some people have estimated, with the peace dividend, Bill Clinton in the 90s, intelligence agencies saw their funding cut by 25%. But 
but the funding is cut, but they're kind of expected to do more with less. So to quote CIA Director Jim Woolsey at the time, the CIA has slain a Soviet dragon, and in its place, uh, it has to confront a bewildering array, a bewildering variety of poisonous snakes, drug traffickers, human traffickers, terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, environmental problems. Um, so problem, you know, main problem for the CIA and intelligence agencies here, it's having to do more with less. Second problem is, uh, with the end of the Cold War, it coincides with the rise of the internet age and the rise of the digital age. And this new age um, requires particular specialist technical expertise for, for, for intelligence agencies to get, to get their head around. So what do intelligence agencies do? Well, they, they, they start building bridges with, they start reaching out to the private sector. Um, the National Security Agency, the NSA, is a good example of this. They start building back, um, uh, partnerships with companies like Naris and Northrop Grumman. Um, a lot of their, their, their backdoor functions are, are effectively privatised. Very interesting, the book on the right, Michael Hayden, former M NSA director, playing to, the in playing to the Edge. In this book, he actually said that his alliance that he forged with the IT industry at the end of the Cold War and after 9-11, he called, he called it the smartest thing he ever did. He, he was incredibly proud of his efforts to merge the world of intelligence with the world of planetary scale computing. With the benefit of hindsight, however, Hayden has started to backtrack on that because he says actually he was, at the time, he was strangely unaware of how ideologically antithetical some of his new allies were to traditional ideas of secrecy. So philosophically, technologists, a lot of people that were brought into the intelligence community, philosophically they see the internet as a very free and creative space. Um, a free and creative space that should not be undermined by realist intelligence agencies who want to install backdoors, etc, etc. And this is, this is, you know, this is symbolised in, in the efforts of people like Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, and also Mark Zuckerberg, the, um, the, 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 the chief executive officer of Facebook. They want to establish an Internet Bill of Rights. Uh, they want to establish an Internet Bill of Rights to preserve digital freedoms, to stop governments, to stop intelligence agencies from trampling on, on the free spirit that they believe lies at the heart of, of the Internet. So my point is that you've started, what, we, what we've been seeing over the last 20 years is we've seen um, the proliferation of a particular species of worker into the national security realm that philosophically and ideologically does not value secrecy in the same way that their predecessors, their institutional predecessors did at the height of the Cold War. And this was brought out... Um, in the work of, of someone called Peter Swire. So Peter Swire was, um, a, I believe he still is, a privacy lawyer. He served on Obama's National Security Agency Review Group in 2013. And he did a very interesting thing. He conducted dozens, if not hundreds, thousands of interviews with people within the intelligence community. And he asked them um, a very simple question. He asked them, in your opinion, is Edward Snowden a whistleblower? or a traitor, and not one single person that he interviewed um, described Edward Snowden as a whistleblower. So for everyone in the intelligence community, Snowden that he interviewed was a traitor. A couple of months later, he did the same exercise, but over on the west coast of the United States. He went out to Silicon Valley, and he asked dozens, hundreds, if not thousands of um, technologists in, in the San Francisco Bay Area and Palo Alto, he asked them exactly the same question. Is Edward Snowden a whistleblower or a traitor? And 90% of them came back and said he's a whistleblower. And it's these type of people that over the last 20 years have, have started to get a foothold within the intelligence community. And this, is a, this presents a massive problem for the intelligence community. How do you guard secrets when the IT talent that you need in order to do intelligence collection and intelligence analysis are have um, anti-secret and libertarian um, predilections and inclinations. It's, it's, an, it's, 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 it's a circle that they, they can't quite square yet. 
final driver behind this current crisis of, of secrecy is, is technology. Um, do please forgive my, uh, my, 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 my photograph there, which I took at a, at a, at a, at a, at a site in, in Rome a, a couple of years ago. So, for the intelligence community, technology, technological advances, um, it is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, technological progress allows for, um, as I was talking about a moment ago, the, the, the collection of vast amounts of, of information and the storage of, of vast amounts of, of information. But I think technological progress, if we're thinking about the scales, who does it really value, the national security state or the leaker, I think on balance actually it's giving the leaker the whistleblower the edge. So if you go back to the 1970s, the era of Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers, so it took Daniel Ellsberg the best part of 18 months working at a photocopying house in Washington, D.C., through the night at a cost of 10 cents per page. It took him 18 months to photocopy 7,000 pages of a Pentagon Papers report. At the start of the computer age, things have moved on a little bit. Um, information then is, is, is not stored so much in, in filing cabinets. It's, in, it's stored on computers, on laptops, on desktops, typically on isolated mainframes. So if you, if you are so inclined and you want to leak that information, what have you got to do? Well, you've probably got to print it off. Uh, in the 1980s, the 1990s, there aren't things like you know, USB drives or CD-ROM drives. You've got to print this off, and then you've, got to, uh, then you've got to evade security personnel, presumably carrying lots of photocopies in your rucksack. It's quite a difficult thing to do. Today, however, you know, there's just a lot, and, and, and Stone has shown this, and, and, and Chelsea Manning has shown this. Today, lots and lots of sensitive national security information is stored on personal computers uh, with connectors for things like flash drives. Um, and, and, and it's much easier, I think. It is much, much easier to, 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 to get, if you are so inclined as a leaker, it's much easier to get your hands on vast amounts of information today and to get it out of the building than it has ever was at the height of the Cold War. Another big change, so un if, if you go back to Daniel Ellsberg's day, he, he, he gets his hands on the Pentagon Papers, he wants to bring this to public prominence. How does he do that? Well, he's really got two options. He either has to write a book about it, which is, you know, could take six months, could take 18 months, could take two years, or he has to go to um, the newspapers. And he has to hope that someone like the Washington Post or Catherine Graham or the New York Times will go along with his plan to publish the information. Today, your leaker can do that. They can write a book, they can go to the newspapers, but they have a host of other means available to them to get information into the public domain. And they can do it much quicker. You know, the internet, it, it is a space, it is a forum, it is a ready-made and available forum for um, the illicit disclosure of, 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 of information. You know, we've seen WikiLeaks, there are a whole host of WikiLeaks clones now. They all offer um, these encrypted drop boxes that, um, in theory at least, allow leakers to take classified information and to drop it into a drop box and have their anonymity, um, to, to have their anonymity preserved. And I think this, um, this phenomenon, this shift to direct dissemination on the internet, it, it, it is an important shift because it removes the journalist as a potential middleman. And sometimes the journalist, as a middleman of a leak, can be a restraining or a constraining influence. So if we go back to 2005, 2006, the journalist Dana Priest has ascertained details relating to the CIA secret prison, CIA rendition programs. Um, actually, I think it was her intention to put all of that out into the public domain. But because going through the press was her means to get that information to the public domain, officials were able to lean on her editor and say, actually, we need to show restraint here. Um, we don't want, for example, you revealing the names of the people um, uh, involved in this program. So WikiLeaks, the, these encrypted drop boxes that have anonymizing software, 
that allow for direct dissemination, direct document dump on the internet, it's, it's a big sea change. It's a big sea change. And it's been predicted, I, I thought this was quite a nice way of, 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 of phrasing it actually. I was talking to um, uh, 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 an engineering professor on my university campus and he's, he, his prediction was just as efforts to stop music and film sharing on the internet have failed, so will attempts to stop the technologically enabled leaker. So I'll just bring this together now. I mean, clearly, clearly it would be hyperbole, it would be incorrect to say that there, 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 there's an end of secrecy. You know, secrecy is over and within 10 years there, 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 there won't be any secrets. I don't want you to, to think that that's my main takeaway today. What I want you to think is my main, main takeaway is that the shift is that today governments can no longer confidently predict how long they will be able to keep secrets. The shelf life of secrets, the half life, that's probably a better word to use, the half life of secrets, I think, is, is much shorter today than it has been in the past. I also think another thing that we've seen is that in, in recent years is that you know, if we go back to the, to, to the 1950s and the 1960s and into the 70s, the secrets that started to tumble out were what I would call historic secrets. So the secrets that were coming out in the 1970s were about activities that had taken place 10, 20, 25 years, 30 years, 40 years in the past. Today, history has been accelerated. History is a lot closer. A lot of the secrets that have come out in the 21st century are about 21st century intelligence activity. That is a big, big change. That is a big, big change. And this is important because as current secrets, as contemporary secrets become known sooner, so the cost of transparency becomes higher for intelligence agencies. So recognizing that it's harder to keep secrets if you're a covert action planner, um, if you're planning an operation, you know, you might think twice. You might think, might think twice about signing off on this operation. Um, I think I put to you that spy chiefs in 2019 need to do what I would call the tweet test uh, before signing off on an operation. They need to ask themselves, how will this look in 10 minutes on the internet in 140 characters? And I think more so today than ever, the, the rule of thumb that CIA Director Stansfield Turner applied in the late 1970s should be followed. So CIA Director Stansfield Turner said that he would never sign off on anything that, if disclosed, he couldn't justify to the public. That he didn't think he could, he could justify to the public. I think any national security practitioner today Commander-in-Chief, policy makers, follow the Turner rule. If you're going to sign something off, if this comes out, are you confident you can justify it in public? Just finally, how else can government respond or how else is government responding to this current crisis of secrecy? Well, we're seeing, we're seeing several things. One thing they're doing, uh, um, this, 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 this particular thing I'm going to tell you, let, let, let's put this particular bit under, under Chatham House rules. Um, national security agencies are... Live stream. Ah, yes, of course. I, I, actually, I, 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 we, can probably, we can probably let this one, um, let this one go. So, um, just about. <laughs> so national security agencies behind closed doors are developing software that they are secretly installing on computers in government offices um, that will analyze the behavior, that will analyze the behavior of the computer user to determine if that individual is exhibiting the type of behavior, the type of web searches, the type of computer activity that might betray the hallmarks of a possible whistleblower. That's very, very interesting. So they've got this software on there that's monitoring how the, what the user is doing on the computer. And then they're putting this information through a fancy algorithm. And that algorithm will try to determine if the individual is showing 
any signs, any hints <coughs> of, of, of a personality that could lead them to, 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 to make an unauthorised disclosure. Very interesting. Another way governments can try to roll back or reverse this crisis of secrecy is, is long prison sentences. So hand out long prison sentences to whistleblowers and leakers in the hope that those long prison sentences will act as a deterrent for future whistleblowers. Um, for government, the great concern is that a whistleblower will come along and that whistleblower will then kind of be like a Pied Piper that will just inspire dozens, hundreds of other whistleblowers to do the same thing with, with impunity. So more draconian prison sentences, the, the, the type like um, Chelsea Manning got until his sentence was computed, uh, commuted, uh, I think it was 35 years in duration, that is one possible way to roll back on, on the tide of disclosure. Another um, thing governments can do is that they can move from what I would call, they can shift from what I would call a defensive posture to information management to what I would call a more offensive posture of information management. So it used to be the case at the height of the Cold War where governments would not say anything and not release anything about their activities. But I think that that's counterproductive. Sometimes the danger of saying nothing is that the vacuum that you create in doing so is then filled by other people. If you don't say something about what you do, an investigative journalist will do it for you. So I think a really good way to potentially minimise some of the blowback that comes from um, unauthorised disclosures is to kind of get ahead of the game a little bit, to get ahead of the learning curve, is actually for intelligence agencies to be a little bit more forthcoming, um, to give in more broad brushstrokes information to the public about their mission and what they're doing and the threats to national security that exist. And they can do this through um, more press releases, they can do this by um, agreeing to write authorised or official histories about their organisation. They can do this by giving spy chiefs the latitude and freedom to do more public talks and, and university engagement. It's just a good way to, to get ahead of, of people who might want to talk about the same stuff, but when they talk about it, put a very, very different spin on it. Put a very, very different spin, a more negative spin on it. Securing Silicon Valley collaboration would be very important if intelligence agencies want to protect their secrets in the 21st century and beyond. And this will be difficult because so many companies in Silicon Valley, I mean, they, they, they've not been particularly discreet about this. They value their profits and they value their, the, 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 the privacy of their users more than they do government secrecy. And we saw this a few years ago after the San Bernardino shootings that... Um, the FBI, um, Apple just absolutely steadfast refused to hand over um, the, 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 the encrypted information that was on the mobile phone of one of the, um, the, 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 the San Bernardino shooters. It just, it, that instance in microcosm um, summed up the, 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 this, this, this fine tuning of the relationship that needs to happen between um, Silicon Valley and, and government. And it is a problem that might be intractable. Another thing we might see, and this will be my, my final point, and this, this really is, is, is something for you perhaps to, to chew over, and I've got no more um, evidence um, for this beyond just a, a final point. Within a generation, we might actually see, um, and I say this tongue slightly in cheek, we might actually see the death of intelligence, or the end of intelligence, at least as a state-run, state-centred, phenomenon. What we might see is intelligence agencies confronted with the alarming possibility that they can't keep secrets anymore. They might give up, um, they might become, they, they might no longer be collectors of intelligence and they might become more curators of intelligence. So if we go back to the Boston Marathon bombings a few years ago, um, hopefully a few of you will remember that. The, the perpetrators of that, um, the, the folks who, who, who pulled off the, the, those heinous attacks, um, were apprehended and caught um, pretty much by public, publicly generated intelligence. 
Um, so what happened in the minutes and hours after the attack, law enforcement authorities put out a message and said, does anybody on their phones, video footage or photographs, does anyone have any footage of an individual um, having a rucksack uh, in, in, the, in, in the hours or minutes leading up to the bomb going off? And the public responded to that call. And they flooded. Uh, they were, the public was essentially their own intelligence gathering body. They then flooded law enforcement and intelligence and security agencies with thousands and tens of, tens of thousands of photographs and, and filmic clips that people had taken on their phones. And then it was the job of, of intelligence agencies to act on that intelligence collection that had already been done, effectively outsourced by members of the public. So I say this, as I say, slightly tongue-in-cheek, slightly in the spirit of jest, but maybe within 30, 40 years we might see the, the, the death of intelligence as a state-centered thing. And actually states won't do intelligence collection, they will just do intelligence analysis. And actually it will be us as global citizens who will be the main intelligence collectors. It's, it's something for you to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm more than happy to, I, I, I'm sort of my own, my own speaker and moderator this evening in the absence of our, of our friend who's, who's caught at, at Reagan. I'm so delighted to take some questions. The gentleman, the gentleman at the back, yes. Yeah, sure. Um, um, Augustus Salzo, my name. He, in, in terms of, uh, just put this, my question in context. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, President Trump had allegedly threatened to hold the security clearances, uh, clearances of General Hayden, and uh, uh, and then of course there's this this sort of brouhaha going on again about uh, John Bolton. His Mm. Thing. I, I, I sort of have kind of a almost a personal interest since Bolton lives, you know, within, sure. within a half mile of me. We used to see him out there on Fernwood Road back in the day. But anyway, um, he is. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what what would, um, in your opinion, if you were to make an educated guess. I mean, mm. why would why would what who would have advised the president to even consider doing that? And if the president had pulled General Hayden's security mm. clearance, what kind of impact? I mean, uh, just just is not having security clearance sort of a liberating thing to mm. be able to tell the whole truth, the truth and nothing but the truth? And in terms of John Bolton, which is sort of the ongoing saga continues, what sort of an impact, at least maybe on the investigations concerning war crimes committed in the 21st century. Uh, I realize there are two questions. Yeah, it, it's on, on the issue of security clearance. So um, I don't know the precise chronology here. So in terms of when Trump tried to, to, to revoke the security clearance of Hayden, but I'm, I'm surmising, I'm guessing that um, it came after or coincided with the publication of Hayden's later, latest book, uh, which I think is called something like uh, Assault on Intelligence. And it's, it's Hayden's account of how, in his view, um, since becoming the president, since becoming commander-in-chief, President Trump has said some pretty strong, had some very, very strong words to say uh, about, about the US intelligence community, I think, you know, there was one instance a few years ago where Trump even compared the CIA to, to sort of Nazi propagandists. So I'm, I'm guessing it was it was that book by Hayden that probably prompted Trump to consider revoking um, Hayden's security clearance. Um, I think it came around the time when uh, General Hayden put out that uh, the tweet or posted a picture of one of the Nazi war camps concerning drawing the whole thing about right. the whole refugee thing. It, I think it was around that time. Th this one could be a real legal 
mess actually because for a number of reasons. Actually, it is the right of every retiring, every departing commander in chief, every previous president, it is their right. And that this, this precedent was established, I believe, dating back to the Eisenhower period. It is their right to be given um, the presidency, uh, well, it's now an all community product, but it is their right to be given the presidential daily brief after they leave the White House. So Barack Obama will still be receiving what Donald Trump is receiving, or perhaps a slightly modified, truncated form of the daily brief that, 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 that Donald Trump is, is receiving. But as a president, even as a past president, the commander-in-chief also has the unilateral legal authority to downgrade that material by himself. So here's a scenario for you. Trump revokes the security clearance of Michael Hayden, but he doesn't revoke Barack Obama's security clearance. And then Barack Obama, who is very close to Hayden, continues, you know, would, would be within his legal authority to give that information to, 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 to Hayden by other means. It's, that's, a, that's a real legal issue there. But please. I would disagree with you uh, on your last point. Okay. I think once President Obama left the office, he is bound by the same strictures that all of us are on what mm. he can do with that information. He can't go to his presidential library and just unilaterally declare it all unclassified. It all has to go through declassification review. So there, there's, there's executive orders and there's laws that, that govern this. And so the gentleman's you know, query about are you liberated once mm. you are no longer clear? Uh, no. Your secrecy obligations are a lifetime. They expire when you die. I, I think, yeah, I mean, I take the point in the industry. But, but I wonder, I may, maybe I should have nuanced my point slightly more. Um, would anyone have, let, let's say a former president did, you know, do something along the lines that I'm describing. Would um, would anyone have the nerve? Would the Justice Department have the nerve? Would um, both houses of Congress have the nerve to constitutionally frog march a former Commander in Chief of the United States off to court for their disclosure? I doubt, it. I doubt very very much. I doubt very very much. So I, I take the point that perhaps there is a legal barrier to a, to, a, to, a, to a president doing that, but um, there might be, be, be uh, you know, the, the, the great and the good can often, um, you know, the, the, there's an elasticity to the laws of the land when it comes sometimes to, to, to the great and the good. Well, you're going to see elasticity in the laws of the land, but, you know, again, on Mm. Or when you sign other forms, you know, later on, the U.S. goes up the ladder. Uh, those forms, some of them are filed for 75 years in the legal house. Yeah, we have that in the United Kingdom, yeah. It's, it's, it's... And so they can come and get you. It's like the, um, the Mafia's Code of a murder. Uh, only the grave can bring release. Yeah, absolutely. I apologise that I don't have a better answer to, to, to your question, but um, I, just, I, I think Trump is he's angry, he's furious that, as he sees it, the intelligence community has, has, has been thwarting him at every turn, uh, even even at the lead up, even in the lead up to, 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 to the election. So he's lashing out, isn't he? He's looking for any way to, 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 to make life difficult for them. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Stephen Allen, and I would say rightly so, since we're in a democracy. So the intelligence community shouldn't be making puppets. Uh, uh, and they certainly shouldn't be spying on uh, presidential candidates. Uh, they, uh, I, I was involved in uh, the discussion over, John Brennan was the first uh, person. Yeah. Who was prominent, and you had a number of uh, former intelligence officials who were uh, becoming consultants on TV networks and uh, 
profiting greatly from mm -hmm. their positions. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, but you had, uh, they were maintaining, even while they were saying, in some cases, things that were just flat out false. So, mm -hmm. you know, made fun of people uh, in my presence for saying the president had been spied on during the campaign, uh, which of course was true. And uh, the, uh, uh, and so you had these people who were doing, uh, you know, making money off of this and uh, were continuing. In fact, all of them, I guess, other than Brennan, uh, mm -hmm. have in fact maintained their clearance. And if they lost it, it would simply mean they couldn't get future information. It wouldn't affect their ability to uh, trade on whatever information they're allowed to give out from their previous service. Um, my, my question, though, was about algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think you touched on this a couple of places. Uh, the ability we have now uh, with artificial intelligence and machine learning to learn things about things, people, to figure out things about people in, in, in ways that you never could have guessed. So Google probably knows everything about the private sex life of 90% yeah. of Americans, for example. Uh, you can create a, a an algorithm that will tell you who the dissidents are, who the likely whistleblowers mm -hmm. are, or who supports the opposite political party if you don't, if you want to use it for mm -hmm. a bad purpose. And the problem, and, and of course the Chinese are doing this to, you know, uh, control the people. Um, the problem is that no human being has that information. No human being knows why the box is making that decision to target that person versus mm -hmm. another person. It's buried down in millions and millions of lines of code and experience uh, in a way that uh, uh, they used to have robots uh, running up down the street out here. And a friend of mine referred to them, and they weren't, I said something about programming the robots by running up and down the street. No, they're training the robots, like you train a dog. Uh, and this is the principle involved. So, what do you, what, how does that affect the ability to keep things secret, given that these are secrets that no human being actually? has, but that you could steal if you stole the information in the AI system. Yeah. So I'll just um, re respond perhaps firstly to your, to, your, to your opening comment about Brennan, and, and it's not just Brennan, isn't it? I mean, it's Hayden, it's Clapper, it's a whole host of former uh, and retired, very senior intelligence officers in, in, in most cases that are publicly speaking ill of, of Donald Trump. Now, I confess I don't know how this is playing out in the United States, but in the UK, um, I think people have found this a little bit distasteful. Um, it's stuck in the craw a little bit to see um, intelligence officers speaking ill of their, their commander-in-chief. Um, in terms of how the newspapers in the UK have written about this, they, they suggest that there, there, there's a special bond there's a special bond between first consumer and spy agency that's being broken here. So I think back to the Bay of Pigs, actually. So after the Bay of Pigs fiasco in April 1960, um, Alan Dulles was pretty much, CIA Director Alan Dulles was pretty much thrown under the bus by, if not President John F. Kennedy, then certainly Kennedy's closest aides, people like Arthur Schlesinger. Um, Alan Dulles, in his retirement, if he'd wanted to, could easily have blown the whistle on all of the, 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 the faults of, of John F. Kennedy. He could easily have written, I mean, he did write a book, The Craft of Intelligence, he wrote several books, but he could easily have said some pretty bad things about President Kennedy if he'd wanted to. But he didn't. But he didn't. And he didn't do that because he felt that there was a, there was a special bond between spy chief whether serving or retired, that had to be respected um, ad infinitum. And that's certainly not, we're seeing, what, not what we're seeing with Cla Clapper and Hayden and, and, and these folks. And um, while I perhaps empathise or at least understand why they're doing it, and I doubtless share many of the concerns that they have about, about the person who, who's currently at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, um, leaving that aside, I still think that it's maybe not, certainly in terms of how it's being played out in the UK, it's something I maybe, I just find a little bit distasteful. And I think actually it will have, I think it will have long-term ramifications that they possibly haven't themselves thought through. Um, because I think um, intelligence officers, when they turn on their TV screens and they go into Barnes and & Noble and they see 
former serving senior intelligence people talking about the president, I think it might well embolden it. You know, they're going to think, well, if, if kind of they can get away with it, maybe I can too. Maybe I can get away with having a, a you know, a love Trump's hate car sticker on the back of my car when I drive um, on, you know, George Washington Memorial Parkway on my Parkway on my way to Langley. So yeah, I, I, I I'm slightly troubled by the by the fracturing of the, of this this special bond. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the 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 algorithms and how. Um, you know, how national security secrets that are in the custody of, of Silicon Valley and, and the tech industry can be protected by intelligence agencies. I think this is a huge problem. And, and one, one good example of this, actually, it was in 2009, the United States was um, still denying, refusing to acknowledge that it was operating a drone campaign in Pakistan. So journalists and freedom of information campaigners in Pakistan approached the US authorities and they said, ah, Google Earth. I've been on Google Earth and there's a mysterious black patch over what I'm fairly certain is an airbase in northwest Pakistan. Can you declassify that please? Because if you declassify it, I'm fairly certain we're going to see predators and reapers on, on, the, on the air patch there. The US intelligence authorities say absolutely not, we're not declassifying that. So what do these journalists and freedom of information campaigners in Pakistan do? They go to Google, they sue Google, they sue the tech industry, and they're successful. Uh, and and, 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 and in, in, in this kind of remarkable moment, Google Earth ends up having to relent. And then suddenly, you can see all of these sort of um, the, 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 the predators and the reaper drones at, at the airbase in Pakistan. And so the, the point here is that civil society got access to information about a sensitive government program, not from the US government, but through one of the US government's private collaborators. So. In answer, to your, in answer to your question, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to keep anything that's being done by the private sector at the behest of the public sector secret. Very, very difficult indeed. Yes, sir. Just Last question, please. I uh, just want to express some skepticism <clears throat> about the potential for big data tools. Uh, it does not, being able to store, retrieve, process data does not generate the data that you need to train the model. Okay. Does not work, so, sir. Does not generate the data you need to train the model. Yeah. Okay. How many uh, cases do we have of leakers? Mm -hmm. A, you know, a substantial number, but not a large number. We have lots of data on purchases on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are frequent observations. Okay, you're you're not going to be able to train any model uh, based on five cases and you know five billion non cases. Okay, so it's uh, we we've, we've had big data for decades in the financial industry. Every you know stock uh, uh, exchange is reported. Lots of models do very good backcasting. None of them are any good forecasting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, the, the principle, that there's a principle uh, with, within your comments there that, that I do agree with, uh, and I, I increasingly agree with, which is that um, private companies are the big generators of intelligence in the 21st century, not necessarily governments. In fact, I was astonished in the in the fallout from the Snowden case, certainly in terms of how it played out in the UK media, that um, newspapers like The Guardian and their, 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 their friends and allies in civil society, civil liberties groups, etc., their ire, their venom, their anger was coming out at NSA and was, was, was firmly in the direction of GCHQ, but there was scant acknowledgement of 
the other stuff that Snowden was revealing was actually there's these tech companies, there's Amazon, there's Facebook, there's Twitter that's just collecting all of this stuff for commercial reasons, not for national security reasons necessarily, but for commercial reasons. And even in the UK media at least, when the Oxford Analytica and the Cambridge Analytica scandals broke, e even now I don't think the, the, these hard, harsh questions, I don't think the glare of public scrutiny is shining brightly enough on private corporations and their intelligence collection in bulk. It doesn't shine as brightly on them as it does on, on the government. And that probably stems, you know, government has had its Watergate, it's had it, it had its Vietnam in the 1970s. Trust in US government is at an all-time low. Um, the US tech industry, private companies, have not had their Vietnam yet. They've not had their Watergate. There's still public faith, there's still public trust in what goes on in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. People like Steve Jobs are held up as, as, as sort of heroes, as martyrs. Um, but I think when they, when they have their Watergate, things will change. Things will change. I, we might just have, yeah, a, a quick, one last quick question. Yeah, a, 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 absolutely. So um, there's an interesting story here. So the first main disclosures um, from British intelligence professionals um, came in, in the 1970s. So people like John Masterman, who was the chairman of the, um, the Double Cross Committee, the, the, the wartime deception uh, in, in outfit in, in the United Kingdom. He was encouraged to write a book on this by the British government in the early 1970s. And then a couple of years later, in 1974, Group Captain Frederick Winterbottom was permitted by Her Majesty's government to write a book called The Ultra Secrets and What Took Place in, in Bletchley Park. These books were sanctioned by the British government as a response to nasty revelations about the Cambridge Five. So in the 1960s, the treachery of Burgess, McLean, and Philby especially with his... They were, they were traitors, yeah. So the British government decides that it needs to wrestle back the narrative of British intelligence and British intelligence history. So they do this. They launch this counter-blasting offensive by sponsoring these wartime histories. But they weren't whistleblowers as such. But then what we get in the 90s... I mean, the first main intelligence whistleblower, I suppose, in, in the UK context would be Peter Wright. So Peter Wright of Spycatcher fame. So he was, if memory serves me, serves me correctly, he was an assistant to the director of MI5. Um, he, he, he had some naughty stories to tell. So this is the individual who claimed that MI5 was bugging and burgling its way around London. This was the individual who claimed that MI5 had been secretly spying on Prime Minister, the Labour Prime Minister, the left-wing Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. Uh, so he was one of the, the, the main advocates of the so-called Wilson plot that, um, that, that argues that MI5, the security service, was trying to get rid of Harold Wilson. Peter Wright also believed that another former director of MI5, Sir Roger Hollis, was in fact the sixth man in the Cambridge firing, was in fact a traitor. So um, Roger Hollis, um, so I do apologise, um, Peter Wright goes to Tasmania and tries to publish his spycatcher book outside of the jurisdiction of UK law and the British authorities, uh, Margaret Thatcher and her cabinet secretary, Robert Armstrong, go all, the way, go all the way around the world unsuccessfully to try and block this. We haven't had the number of whistleblowers, though, that you've had. We've had Peter Wright, we've had David Shaler, We've had Richard Tomlinson, and also we had the GCHQ whistleblower Catherine Gunn in 2003. I believe there was a film about her, yeah. uh, her, her revelations recently. So she was the one who, while she was at GCHQ, stumbled on information that seemed to suggest that the Americans and the Brits were encouraging NSA and GCHQ to keep tabs on members of the UN who would have been voting on the, 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 yeah, the, the, the resolution to invade Af Af Afghanistan. Exactly. But I pretty much named all the whistleblowers on one hand there. Wright, Shaler, Tomlinson, Gunn. We don't have the numbers that, that you've had here. And you have the Official Secrets Act, which really can keep a lot of this out of the press. Yeah, 
Ab ab absolutely. And, and the, the Official Secrets Act, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's important to note that, um, first of all, if you're a government, if you're an intelligence or a government employee in the United Kingdom, you are bound by the Official Secrets Act, irrespective of whether you sign it or not. Actually, signing the Official Secrets Act is a purely symbolic, ritualistic thing to do. You're bound by it the moment you start working for, 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 for government. But the Official Secrets Act is important because, and this is why I don't think you see so many whistleblowing cases, because the Official Secrets Act makes it a criminal offence for the government employee to leak the information, but it also makes it a criminal offence for the newspaper to publish it as well. And I don't know if you've got anything similar, no, no, probably no. nothing approaching that at all. No, all we have here is the Constitution of the United yeah. States against all enemies, foreign or domestic. Yeah. Yes, but it says if you have it, you can bring it. Yeah. And that's your freedom of speech. Absolutely. You've had, you've had a few cases going after reporters, but that's considered a, sort of a scandal. If you yes. So I think with, with that act in, in, in operation, um, it, it's had a chilling effect. It's had a chilling effect on the whistleblowers, but also on the conduits who would be blowing the allowing them to blow the whistle, namely the newspapers. If I may add one more advantage that you have, is that you have retained small intel organizations. Mm. Our problem is you didn't mention we had the peace deal when, when we downsized. I think you've got 23 intelligence organizations, is yes, that right, in the United States? thousands of oh. analysts off the street. When Hayden told us in 06 that half of our analysts have had less than five years of experience. Wow. So, and then you're trying to deal with that problem, yeah. well, and, and then complicating the, uh, you know, the, the uh, technology age, was easy to mm. We've certainly got our challenges on the horizon with Brexit, which would be quite interesting. <laughs> In terms of intelligent sharing, it would be very uh, interesting too. Thank you all, all very much for coming along. Thank you.